the traditional notion of finance is the following. Any economy has certain investment needs. There are entrepreneurs out there who have certain ideas. Uh, they can do something that is productive, that will lead to growth in the economy. And the role of finance is to find such entrepreneurs and to fund them, uh, providing them with the financial resources so they can do all of these positive return projects for the economy to grow, right? In this narrative, finance is following something more fundamental, which is these entrepreneurs with profitable ideas, these projects which are going to lead to growth. And you just want to make sure that finance doesn't get in the way of leading to growth and facilitates growth, right? So, so, so finance just follows the real growth opportunities in the economy. Now, there is obviously a lot of truth in this story. Certainly, a lot of what finance does is funding investments and so on, and there's nothing wrong with it. However, if you take that as your only or even primary story, we have a problem in explaining the last four decades or so of finance. I'm here today with Professor Atip Mian from Princeton University and the director of the Julius Rabinowitz Center. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, we're here to talk about among other things, Economists for Inclusive Prosperity. You, Danny Roderick, Anadit Mahdi, Aaron Dubé, Suresh Nadu, many people who've been in and around the INET community. And uh, I'm interested in why you decided to do this. What do you think its purpose is? How, what will it aspire to accomplish? And how we can be helpful? I think uh, the, the motivation for this is um, kind of um, clear um, if you look at what's happening around us, uh, both politically and also in terms of uh, the uh, economic fundamentals. Um, there is this growing realization for a while now that the economy um, is not working for everyone. You see that with the rise of uh, inequality. You see that with the decline in social mobility. You see that with the rise in political polarization. Um, and, you know, all of this uh, collectively suggests that there is uh, potentially a, a common theme or a common cause that is moving a number of important variables around. Some of these variables are on, in politics, others in financial markets, others in you know, relative growth of wages of the top 1% versus the median income and things of that sort. And so there's a need to understand what's going on. And that's kind of the philosophy when it says, you know, economists for inclusive prosperity is that uh, just as a matter of uh, 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 principle, it is, I think, uh, important that we, we try to look for models of economic growth that take everyone together, uh, that are broadly uh, inclusive in uh, in taking all segments of the population along. Um, so I thought it was really interesting that uh, we could get people from different um, uh, dimensions within the economic discipline, whether it's people from finance, from macro, uh, labor, politics, and so on, to think of this common question, because we all have our own way of kind of you know, approaching this particular question from our respective fields, uh, but we typically don't think of this as a collective effort. And uh, that's, personally, I thought that was uh, quite valuable exercise to do. And once you have done that, to think about the common themes and the common implications, um, uh, then you can have a conversation uh, back with the policy uh, side of things and think about how we can potentially reorganize the way we do things. The right. place where you are now and your group with what you refer to as collective introspection right. is a redefinition of the values of the purpose and priorities that the economics profession can contribute. The world is beckoning through dysfunction, through frightening, unsustainable politics, and you guys are rising to the occasion. Well, I mean, I, I think there is um, uh, something that the economic profession kind of owes to this collective problem, um, which is to come up with a coherent uh, framework that A, explains why we are observing what we are observing, as you said, to look at the empirical evidence and to rationalize that empirical evidence within a common framework. And then once you have that, that narrative, then to 
take it to a new direction to say, okay, how can we build a counterfactual world that looks different? What steps are needed mm -hmm. to build an alternative uh, system that works better, that doesn't lead us to the same kind of problems that we have gotten to over the last you know, 50, 60 years or so? Um, and that requires a level of thinking that at, for, for various reasons, the you know, economic discipline kind of trains us to, to think in those terms. And that's, and that's partly, again, is, is, is the, the value proposition of this kind of an effort that while no single individual can, can do all of these steps, um, collectively we can help each other kind of navigate this, uh, this, this process and come up with some policy prescriptions that are hopefully useful. Diagnosis is better than denial. And once you engage in diagnosis and you fortify each other, because I've seen across the spectrum of the original members, many of you have different types of expertise, but it all contributes to a mosaic that shows what might call the breadth and scale of the problem. That allows you to, how do you say, realize the magnitude of the challenge and come up with constructive prescriptions and doing it together. You know, the old saying, safety in numbers, but, but these are quality thinking people all joining together. It's like a mutual recognition. I'm sure there's solace in, uh, how would I say, knowing you're not walking alone in no, carrying this banner. Absolutely, as you said, you know, there, is a, there is a strength in, in numbers, but there's also confidence in finding out that you're not the only one who's thinking mm -hmm. uh, one way, that there are other people who you respect who are arriving at very similar or related conclusions, and then and then exactly, you know, then then you start interacting and collaborating more, and say, okay, you know what, this is maybe I'm, yeah. I'm also getting at something, um, real here, because you know, it's it it, it 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 we are getting to the same conclusion or similar conclusions, um, so that pr process is very helpful. I mean, the other, the 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 other um, um, aspect that is important here is that economics, again, as a discipline, has had a certain stereotype attached to it. Um, uh, which has been accepted to some degree or varying degrees within the political sphere by the, by the politicians and the public that economics as a discipline says that, you know, markets always work, that, that you know, uh, all kinds of regulation is bad mm -hmm. or uh, that, you know, money is best spent um, by people um, privately and then there is less of a need for public funds to fund infrastructure or schools or education right. and so on. Right. Um, that's just not true as, you know, as you could, we, we cannot just have that uh, kind of a sweeping statement and say that this is what ec economics uh, means. Economics as a discipline, especially over the last three, four decades, has worked very carefully in terms of understanding the real frictions that exist out there, that people don't have full information, for example, mm -hmm. that people um, um, you know, th there are transaction costs when, when people are, are, are trying to um, work with each other, that there are externalities that people don't take into account when they are deciding what kind of investments to make, when, when they are, when they are uh, deciding what, you know, um, what, what kind of uh, uh, infrastructure to fund, for example. And sometimes we do need uh, agents of collective action. And government is obviously one important example of that. So it is a very important institution. It is an institution that we need to think very carefully about its design. We need to think very carefully about its scope. And we need to think very carefully about kind of the rules of the game that determine how citizens engage with the government. That all of those are very important decisions and questions because they collectively determine how the society and the economy evolves. So, so you know, this is so the the the. The ec economics as a discipline is a lot more nuanced than yes. its somewhat caricatured version that is thrown out in the media. And again, I think that's another reason why it's important for us to come together and to say, look, we are coming from different backgrounds, different institutions and all of that. Um, and we have something to say that you might find surprising uh, relative to, again, that simpler narrative that has been thrown out too often. Uh, and and sometimes for just you know, sort of a political conveniency that it's, you know, I, I, I just I can just use that as an excuse to push my particular agenda, for example. And so I think it's important to, to give a more nuanced, a richer um, 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 a narrative to the public about you know, what, what the economists as a, as, a, as a discipline have to offer in this. So I think we need a little bit more pressure on textbook reform
I actually think that the young students now are very often in rebellion against the dogmatism of simple textbooks. I don't quite know what the resistances are, but I do, I do agree with you that the scholars are more nuanced, and as you all step forward, you can make that case even more vividly, as you suggest, uh, exactly. and, and I mean, dispel part that. Uh, part of it is a communication problem, with, and, 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 and I, I completely agree with you. Textbooks are partly uh, to blame in this. Um, part of it is, you know, the, the old adage that, you know, little knowledge is a dangerous thing. So, you know, you, it, it takes time to understand um, all of the nuances and, uh, and, 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 and before. I'm not so interested in beating up old textbook writers, right. but I am asking them to evolve now right. because I think it matters. Right. And, uh, right. and I know INET has an initiative with the core yeah. Uh, yeah. project, which, uh, which, I, which I think is exactly what we need. It's, 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 it's yeah. going in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit of history of thought and a little bit of economic history added to the conceptual framework so right. that people understand that ideas came from structure, challenge, context, vested interests, yes. uh, how you say, an evolving economy, that, exactly. th that the ideas didn't all occur in a vacuum. Exactly, and, exactly. Uh, and, the, and the other side of it is if you look at economics as a field, the huge sea change in, within economics is the role of empirical evidence. Yes. And obviously the IT revolution <laughs> and the, you know, just the proliferation of data has very much to do with it, but it's, that's the other piece that is missing from the more traditional textbooks which is you can't just postulate something and present a hypothesis as if it's the ultimate truth. Mm -hmm. You have to have developed this habit of taking any idea back to the data mm -hmm. and throwing it against the evidence and saying, okay, is this yeah. actually true? Yes. Uh, that you know, these things, um, these ideas play out as they are supposed to in, in some versions of the model under some specific assumptions, but all models are ultimately based only as good as the validity of their assumptions. And so we need yes. to test the validity of those assumptions by, you know, again, uh, testing them, comparing them against actual data. And it's that discipline, it's that exercise that really, you know, moves you in a better direction. And mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. tradition has to be built into our students from the get-go. Let's move to your contribution, mm -hmm. your policy brief, mm -hmm. and your specialty, which I've been quite familiar with being involved in finance and financial regulation myself. You described how a financialized economy has grown in part as a result of concentration of income and wealth yeah. and what the ramifications are structurally and what what you might call fragility has emerged yeah. and how we might uh, improve resilience and evolve things. Yeah. What, what do you see as, what, what spurred financialization at the outset? Yeah, this is a, you know, we were talking more in abstract about the, the usefulness of empirical evidence and so on, but now I can talk about my own area as an example of what I feel is like the value of empirical work and really thinking about the, 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 the theories in a bit more critical fashion and, and asking yourself, does it make sense? We talked about textbooks and we talked about traditional models. So let's, let's think of all of that in the context of finance. How do we think of finance in a traditional textbook model? The traditional notion of finance is the following. Any economy has certain investment needs. There are entrepreneurs out there who have certain ideas. Uh, they can do something that is productive, that will lead to growth in the economy. And the role of finance is to find such entrepreneurs and to fund them, uh, providing them with the financial resources so they can do all of these positive return projects for the economy to grow, right? In this narrative, finance is following something more fundamental, which is these entrepreneurs with profitable ideas, these projects which are going to lead to growth, and you just want to make sure that finance doesn't get in the way of leading to growth and facilitates growth, right? So, so, so finance just follows the real growth opportunities in the economy. Now, there's obviously a lot of truth in this story. Certainly, a lot of what finance does sure, is sure. funding investments and so on, and there's nothing wrong with it. However, if you take that as your only or even primary story, we have a problem in explaining the last four decades or so of finance. 
Let me explain why. If this was the primary goal of finance, which is again to fund investment, to fund real investment and growth, to fund capital formation in the economy, the problem with that story or that narrative is that if you look since the 1980s, so roughly four decades, um, what we see is that overall capital formation as a share of GDP has not really changed much in advanced economies. It's roughly stayed at the same level. Some would argue it has even gone down mm -hmm. slightly. And at the same time, we have seen an incredible growth in finance, which sometimes people refer to as the financialization of the economy. So for example, if you look at total credit to GDP, include all kinds of credit, household credit, uh, non-financial firm credit, uh, sovereign credit, the financialization of the economy has doubled or more. That's a huge increase in the, just the amount of credit that is slushing around. And yet, we haven't seen any major shift in the level of investment or the level of capital formation or the rate at which capital formation is going on in the economy. What I'm trying to say here is that in, in term, if we want to understand the major increase or expansion in credit, the traditional story that it is all being used for capital formation and for making real investments and so on does not really add up. And the productivity numbers would And the productivity are numbers are, haven't moved. Uh, if, in, if anything, they have moved kind of some in the other direction. So we need to think of finance differently. It's clear that this traditional story is not sufficient to explain what is going on. Okay, so let's move forward. When you look more, more at granular data to really understand what is this new finance financing, what you very quickly realize is that a lot of it is financing stuff like households, stuff like real estate. Um, and the, 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 the natural question is, why is that happening? Um, when you look at it more closely, what you find is that there is actually a close connection between this change in financialization that, as I said, really starts to happen around 1980s. And something else that also starts to happen around 1980s, which is this rise in um, global inequality, the rise of the share of income going to the top 1% and... Uh, and uh, Who then have a large, large marginal propensity to save exactly. and a need for financial exactly. services. Exactly. So the question is, okay, what does that have to do with this, with this growth in finance? Um, and when you think about it, you realize that one possible alternative hypothesis or an additional hypothesis is that as more and more of the income is going into the hands of this top 1%, we know from a lot of evidence that the top 1% um, of the income distribution, they have a very high marginal propensity to save. That is to say, if you give them an additional dollar, they will save a large proportion of it. Now, what does that mean in practical terms? Well, saving goes back into the financial system. So that money is going to be channeled back into the financial system, basically asking the financial system to push it somewhere. And then the financial system will go about the business of finding uh, who will borrow that money to do something with. Now that's where the traditional model kind of breaks because it's, the causality is now going the other way around. It's not that there are actual investment opportunities which is finding finance. Now you have these additional savings in the financial sector, which is trying to come up with investment ideas or something else. Mm -hmm. And what has happened over the last 40 years is that it hasn't gone much into new investment ideas, but it has gone into something else. So what is that something else? That something else is financing um, more and more of private consumption through credit. And so that's why a large increase in credit over the last 40 years is, um, is basically explained by the rise in household credit. Um, now, how do we justify that? Well, again, it's the other side of the same coin, which is that as inequality rises and more and more income is going into the hands of the top 1%, if they are not consuming at the same rate as the other 99%, the economy will tend to contract. It will have a shortage in aggregate demand unless we can somehow channel that money back in the form of credit into the hands of the bottom 99% and raise their consumption level. The broader idea is that it's the finance leading the 
economy as opposed to the economy leading finance, right? Oh. So that's that's a different way of thinking about finance, just mm -hmm. at, at, at a broader uh, mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. And this kind of thinking, once you realize that it has many implications that are that you wouldn't get if, again, you had the more traditional textbook model of finance where it's just chasing uh, actual profitable investment opportunities in the world out there. So for example, um, the problem with finance being a byproduct of rising inequality is that that process cannot go on forever. The reason for that is that if the rise in inequality continues, you constantly need credit, additional credit creation to create additional demand um, in, the, in, the, in the local economy, which essentially means that the credit to GDP ratio will have to continue to rise. Now that cannot go on forever. For a while, the economy tries to accommodate that rise in financialization, that rise in credit to GDP by lowering the interest rate. So that's the other very important characteristic of the last 40 years, which is that the interest rate, just think of the long-term interest rate, like the 10-year rate, for example, that has continued to steadily fall from the 80s. And so now all of these three series are exactly connected. Rise in inequality, rise in credit to GDP ratio, and a fall in, in the price of credit, in the, a fall in the long-term interest rate. They have to line up together that way. Otherwise, the economy has a problem, it's right? It's unsustainable. It's unsustainable. It triggers, uh, it, it triggers something that exacerbates the downturn because, in essence, as you described, the channel of funding private demand, when that stops, you go into a slump which exacerbates the fear of default risk, which slows the credit flow, and, and exactly everything right. unravels. In a, it's like an amplifier on the downside. Exactly. Yeah. This process is fundamentally unsustainable. Yes. Because ultimately, <coughs> interest rates cannot go below zero. When they get close to zero, there's all kinds of other nu nuisances that get created and so on. Um, and by this time, the other thing that is happening is that people, you know, this is taking a few decades to, to, to take place. And so over this time, people really get, because it's, it's not, fun if you tell me that you know my way of living is basically dependence on credit that's not how people would like to that's not a very aspirational well, living right yeah. exactly <laughs> exactly and so so it, it's it's creating all this this while this 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 you know social tensions as well yeah. um, um, and ultimately just the whole process cannot go on forever because credit to gdp cannot go to infinity interest rates will stop at some point and and at that level the economy becomes very fragile Small shocks to the system can lead to downward spirals, uh, for example. Any, any obstacle in credit creation will also tend to shrink the economy or will be a he strong headwind, headwind for the economy. And at that point, um, you really have to go back to the basics and ask yourself, well, this whole process is fundamentally unsustainable. Well, I'm fascinated by your contribution in diagnosis to this collective endeavor and also the remedies that you prescribe. And it's an interesting, it's almost like turning trickle down on its head. That in the old days everybody said if you unshackle the most prosperous, everybody will do better. It'll be a positive sum game. Okay. People are still waiting. Now you're suggesting if we go in the other direction, it may be a positive sum game and you seem to have very uh, sound reasoning and uh, how do I say, I look forward to the amplification of your arguments and the support of your colleagues. And uh, I would say, thank you for thank you. joining in the leadership of this. This is, uh, this is very encouraging. Thank you for supporting this, thanks.